I've told you before, but I love the idea of traveling around the world. There's something about going on a long journey that just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside, whether it's doing a day trip with my significant other or doing a two or three day road trip with the crew here at the channel to go to an event. I just enjoy the experience. I get to see and meet people. I get to experience new things. And I get to see this, this beautiful pale blue dot that we live on. And throughout my childhood, I've watched other people make trips around the world. Of course, one of the most important to me was the long way round with Charlie Borman and Ewan McGregor, but I've always wanted to make a trip of my own. Sadly, I don't think I ever will, but I do get to live vicariously through others. And today I get to vicariously live through the owners of this rather unique Nissan Aria who are driving pole to pole. That's right. An electric vehicle expedition from one end of the planet to the other. They are, of course, the wonderful Chris and Julie Ramsey. I'm going to welcome them on now. It has been an absolute pleasure to follow their progress thus far. They're here in Vancouver, Washington right now after spending a few days in Portland, Oregon for Formula E. Chris, Julie, welcome. Welcome, Nikki. It's so cool to be here. So we've known each other for some number of years now. You, uh, you've been in the EV world for coming up on 10 years now, right? Pretty much, yeah. And I say, I think I've known you or we've connected through social media for pretty much most of that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was a fully charged live that we first met yeah. before I left the UK. And it's been wonderful to see this expedition. So your first expedition, this is not your first. No. <laughs> your first electric car expedition was just a little jaunt from London to Mongolia. Tell us about that, Julie, in a Nissan Leaf. Yeah, so back in 2017, my bonkers of a husband here decided that he would like to take a car but not just any car, it's a Nissan Leaf, 30 kilowatt with a rate, max range of about 80, 90 miles from London to Southern Siberia, Mongolia. And yeah, and back then there was like no charging infrastructure, public charging infrastructure in many of those countries. And yeah, he had the bonkers idea and we went off and did it. So you had a 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf. Yep. And Chris, you had to drive through countries with no infrastructure. I remember one, memorable moment where you were i think you were in somewhere in russia and some guy just went up a, a power line and plugged in <laughs> yeah. a charging cable so you could charge your leaf yeah i mean at that point we'd never driven past france right so we're driving france beyond france was the unknown for us and we drove like basically through the rest of europe into turkey from turkey is where we had no charging infrastructure and Julie always says we relied on the kindness of strangers because we literally just turned up to people and went, our Shuko plug and went, can we uh, plug into your domestic socket? And, and that particular situation was, I will say it was done through controlled circumstances. So don't go and do that at home. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> it's probably one of the highlights. Of it was. The, it's of the most, the it's the most seen picture, isn't it? It's the, it's the highlight it's picture. It's an iconic picture. And ironically, it was the last charge as well before we reached the finishing point and it was the fastest charge. <laughs> so we, um, we, we basically, the, Ru the Russian Energy, one of the Russian Energy companies got in contact through Nissan Russia because they saw what we were doing and they said, we can give you a charge. And we were driving, uh, we said, okay, no problem, where do we go? And they told us the little town, went to that little town. A Russian guy points down into a forest. We drive down into that forest track, which I would never normally follow a little, a Russian guy down into a, a forest track. Um, and then basically we thought there's a hut, we'll get a charge in that hut and we'll get some sleep. The, I gave the cable, charging cable to the electrician because he wanted it and I thought he was just going to go find the plug. And I chatted with the, the, the team that was there and then turned around, I found he'd taken the end off the cable and he was wiring it directly into the electricity pylon. So we actually, from, from Turkey to that point, we'd be relying on like 10, 12 hour charging. So it was like three, you know, two and a half kilowatt, three kilowatt charging. Um, at that point we got 6.6. .6. <laughs> which was the maximum that that yeah. particular car could exactly. handle. Exactly. Now, you did that one for charity. You raised a significant amount of money. 
in the process of having this amazing adventure. I am very proud of the fact that Transport Evolved actually helped yes. support that first adventure. And thank you very much for getting involved. Well, thank you to everybody at home for watching to make that possible. <laughs> but this one is, this adventure is completely different, right? So you're traveling from the magnetic north yeah. right. to the South Pole. Mm -hmm. In this, tell us <laughs> yeah. about, about yeah. it. Yeah, so it's crazy to think that we've taken this car, which we have, to the magnetic North Pole. It's so it's probably worth pointing out that it's the 1823 location of the Magnetic North. Mm -hmm. Just because it, it changes, it changes all the time, yes. And yeah. the challenge for us going into the Arctic Ocean is a challenge in itself, right? So we had to choose the, a significant location that was kind of still as a, as, as a stretch, basically. So Yeah, so 1823 Magnetic North Pole location, driving approximately 17,000 miles to the geographical South Pole in Antarctica. It's never been done in history before by any vehicle. We're doing an electric vehicle. And yeah, it's, uh, we've already achieved the first part. And we're now passing through Portland on the way down south on our way to the south. So yeah, that's uh, pole to pole. And this is the first electric car in history to go to a magnetic North Pole location. So we've already achieved a bit of history there. And, and, you know, I think you are top tier adventurers now, having achieved that. Which is one of the reasons why, you know, the, the, the travel, the trip that you're making is one of the reasons why we have this particular car yeah. that has been heavily modified. So your first expedition with the Nissan Leaf involved a lightly, lightly tweaked Nissan Leaf that you then went on to drive for a number of years afterwards. Mm -hmm. yep. And it had slightly larger tires and I think that maybe a, a few mods here and there. The Leaf that we used, I mean, the main modifications we made, we kept the standard tires. We raised the suspension slightly just right. to give it a little bit of extra ground clearance. We put a traditional sump guard. So basically a piece of metal underneath the front to connect, to protect the charge of the inverter, the motor. Um, and we took the back seats out and put a roof rack on. So that was pretty much it. We didn't change again like this. We didn't change battery, drivetrains, all that kind of thing. And you haven't changed really much in this. So this is a Nissan Aria E-Force. Yep. Yes. So all wheel drive variant. Yep. Obviously Europe got the E-Force before North America did. So if you're watching this in North America, it's, it's only just gone on sale over here, but it's been on sale in, in Europe for a while. You've had some modifications made to the wheels. <laughs> the, yeah. the, biggest, the biggest thing that everybody notices, right? So you look at this and everybody kind of goes, sees the car and goes, wow, look at the size of those tires. So they're 39 inch BF Goodridge KO2 tires. Um, they're running on around about, I think it's about around about 17 inch rims. And the idea behind those, that's kind of outside of the, obviously the car drivetrain system. That's really the thing that's making it possible for us to travel in the Arctic and Antarctica. Because those tire pressures are probably sitting about 30 PSI just now. But in Arctic and Antarctica, they sit around anywhere between four and 10 PSI. Right, so because, to give you more surface area. Yeah, displaces so the weight. See. Yes, exactly. Displaces the weight and gives us good traction as well. Yeah, it was like we're just floating over the snow and the terrain up there. and. Um, yeah, it's crazy to think that that was down at around 4 PSI, just <laughs> traversing those What's it like to drive in the Arctic? Let's, <laughs> let's go there. Because, I mean, I've driven, yeah. I've driven within the Arctic Circle on a nicely prepared ice lake um, on a test ground that was, that was operated by Volvo. But I've not been, like, out in the middle of nowhere with polar bears and stuff. What, what was that like? I describe it as extreme off-roading. Obviously, there's no roads and you... The terrain constantly changes, doesn't it? Depending if whether you're on frozen sea ice, whether you're on lake, whether you're on land, whether you're through going through rock, uh, rock boulder fields, it's just constantly changing. So it was challenging to say the least. It wasn't easy. The, the suspension was getting uh, <laughs> uh, tested, that's for sure. And um, somebody I would say... liked to take care a few times. <laughs> um, I mean, I did as well. So, but you were better and, than um, me. Yeah. So, uh, and we really punished the car i yeah. would say in the arctic and it performed amazingly didn't it it yeah. stopped suspension on the car and um, the suspension didn't go it, um, like i say we did take air and we did also have an accident <laughs> okay, someone hit fault. a rock but to be fair it was covered in snow you didn't see it but um we did have an accident yeah. along the way um but you know testament to evs testament to this car it had 
other than that accident that yeah. we um, needed repaired, it, there was zero breakdowns considering the off-road conditions we were on. So yeah. sometimes it was smooth, but majority of the time it was like this. So, um, but it was it was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, literally, it I mean, was yeah. amazing. You, was, you watch documentaries like David Attenborough documentaries and all this, and you look at this fast polar landscape, polar bear plodding through, and you think that's that's the Arctic. And it literally, it, it's like that. You get there and you're kind of like, wow, you're just mesmerized because you're driving around and then suddenly we're driving on effectively nice flat sea ice um, that's been kind of, uh, that's formed. But then suddenly within 15, 20 minutes, you can then come across ice ridge fields. Yeah. So you've got to cross, you've got to pass through those yeah. effectively ice walls. And sometimes you need a detour because some of these pressure ridges are yeah. like too high. So you've kind of got to kind of find the path to kind of go through type thing so I, um, i'm just i just want to go and do it now yeah. so yeah. breathtaking you've other than other than the wheels yeah and mm -hmm. you've had some structural metal work at the front and the rear which you were telling me the other day is to help you in case you get stuck off-roading yeah. everything else is is standard and it's not a standard north american no. aria this is a european spec aria obviously I'm assuming people can tell from your accents that you're from Scotland. <laughs> yes. Um, this is not a, a, a right-hand drive car. You opted to get a left-hand drive car because I think all of the countries you're going to be traveling through a left-hand drive. They are. Which and makes in it some of the easier. countries as well, um, you can't take a, a left-hand drive, sorry, right-hand drive car into those countries. So. Right. So you, you've had it made in, as a left-hand car. But everything else inside is just the same as a production Nissan Aria. You were telling me that some of the driver assistance technology no longer exists because of the modifications yeah. Yeah. made yeah. to accommodate these low pressure tires. But other yeah. than that, it's yeah, it's just a regular. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing. So to very quickly blast it, yeah, we've got the tires, and like I say, that's where Arctic Trucks have done all their engineering work. It's basically how do you make 39 inch tires fit a stock area with stock suspension to not raise the suspension too much because we want to keep that center, that good center of gravity, the the, the center of balance as well. So that's been done there. This is cut a load, way load of body work. We've not touched the suspension, as I said, not touched the drivetrain. And the idea behind that, like our other previous adventures, is people look at that and go, well, that's essentially, outside those big tires, a car in the showroom that I can go and get. Right. And I know what it's capable of. That's what it's really capable of. It can be chucked into the harshest of environments on the planet and it survives. Right. So I can drive to Seattle, you know, yeah. kind yeah. of thing. Um, there's a big skid plate right underneath. Um, with a subframe that's dropped down and that just protects everything underneath because as Julie says we were coming down on big chunks of ice and it was getting absolutely pounded but interior again it's been left as you say left standard because we need to live in this car and live with this car for basically 10 months of the expedition right. and when you approached Nissan and said how about it what was the reaction so Nissan and Arctic trucks are the two kind of big players yeah. in helping yeah. you get to yeah. this point. Yeah. And Arctic Trucks have done an amazing job with the modifications and there were also our support team up in the polar regions as well. We obviously can't go there on our own so we had two support vehicles with us and um, provided by Arctic Trucks and just want to just say they were absolutely amazing. Couldn't have done it without them. And presumably when you get to the South Pole you'll meet up with the support yeah, team correct. there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's, so between Yellowknife which is the main point um, up in Canada where we left the support team because that's actually backed in civilization. Um, and then to Punta Arenas down in uh, Chile, that's where we then meet up with Arctic Trucks again. Um, but between that point, it's just me and Julie, and I don't know if that's a bad thing for her um, or, or what, but you know, it's, in, in honesty, it's, mm -hmm. that's where we don't need that kind of level of support. Right. Yeah. And sometimes you're staying in hotels and sometimes you're camping yeah, it, on, yes. on our, the roof. uh, rooftop tent. So Julie's favorite modification. The other modification we've got addition to the car is our rooftop tent where we stay in um, when we stick, well, wild camp or we visit RV camps. The good thing about RV camps is electricity. It means that we can plug in and get a charge overnight, wake up in the morning fully charged and away we go. This thing's great. It's so easy to put down, put back up. Um, yes, it does um, eat into the range of the car. As do the tyres. Um, as do the tyres. <laughs> as do every modification we've done, it probably yeah. doesn't help the range. We're doing everything you, sh to, you shouldn't do it to an EV right. um, to um, improve its range. My F-150, which I parked behind so people can see how they compare in terms of size. Because I think the battery sizes are 
No, you're behind. I've got 130 yeah. kilowatt hours. You've got, 130. Hours and you've got 90, 87. 87. 87. Um, and so, you know, in terms of, of height, your bonnet, your hood are about the same height now as my truck. When I'm towing anywhere between 100 and 150 miles and you're about 190, 180, 190. I would say realistically, we're, if we if we drive super carefully, and probably annoy quite a lot of people on the roads. We're, we're getting, we can get 180, maybe 190 if we're, if we're super careful. Um, but from the reality is we're stopping every 20, 120 to 150 miles max. So we do have about maybe 15 to 20% left. So give us that little buffer just in case. And obviously so. in North America, at least until you cross into Mexico, charging stations aren't too difficult to find. This is a CCS Type 2 car though, so you're having a, you've got an adapter to use with CCS Type 1 charging yes. stations. Yes, we have, and it's probably worth just saying on that as well as had the situation not happened in the world that we've all been through, um, this probably would have been an American car. Right. That was, the, that was part of the original plan. So we can plan. blame COVID. <laughs> blame COVID, <laughs> right, got it. So, it's, and so it would, would have been a bit of a different situation. We wouldn't have used adapters. So that's why we're kind of saying to people as well is at the moment, if we have challenges on the expedition, which we will, but in terms of the challenges that we have, maybe because of an adapter converting US, European to US, is don't look at us as the example, the rule for electric vehicles. We've got that added, you know, complication because added to it. Yeah. Just the way that things We're a unique out. case, yeah. isn't it? There's not yeah, going to be is. very many people taking a European electric vehicle or Aria into the States to, uh, to drive. But in terms of America, we've, you know, there are charges. That's the thing. There is a vast charging network. Um, some good. Some neat. Welcome which is the to way Lake it is. Land. That's all I'm going to say here. I can say that. You said it. <laughs> With impunity. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you're really at a point now where you know the next few weeks are going to be fairly relaxed because hopefully it, it, it's almost like a shakedown for the tougher stuff. Yeah. When exactly. you hit the southern hemisphere, are there any? What do you guys think is going to be the most challenging part of this trip? Mm. There's, there's many challenges to kind of come because at the end of the day when we get into South America there are charges in South America so there's a few mainly 50 kilowatt DC charges but we've been living with that with this car anyway so that's not an issue for us and then a lot of 7 kilowatt um, so we've got to make sure we're able to access them you can do so much planning and preparation but when you get there if the apps aren't working or you can't get yeah. the app yeah. then you've got to You've got to phone up a helpline. There's a language when you don't speak the language. Well. Yeah, <laughs> so it reminds me of good. one of my first trips to mainland Europe in a Leaf. Was we got into France, and then we got into Belgium, and there we stopped because as soon as we crossed into Belgium, not it wasn't the fact that there weren't charging stations; it was accessing the charging stations. That Funny, was we the had big exactly the same exactly the same thing. thing. Yeah. When we hit Belgium when we did the Mongo Rally. <laughs> And yeah, nothing. Yeah. yeah, and we just turned around and went back because we were like, we're not going to make our our appointment. I'm hoping you guys have a little bit more of a flexible schedule with with your trip. We do. I mean, there's a lot of plan, a lot of time in South America that I've literally planned. Each day is like one charge. As in, we get up in the morning, we drive. That's it. That's our that's our day stops. But in reality, we get a nice, we get a DC charge or we get like, we get maybe a couple of hours on a seven kilo or seven kilowatt charger. We can move on a bit further so we can make up time and ground. Um, but we have float built into that as well. So. And you're hopefully going to be hitting kind of the, the southern tip of South America just as spring is starting to get into motion. Is that the plan? As in, we'll hit the southern tip of South America when? About November time, is yeah, it? Yeah, well... October, late, November? Uh, yeah, I was yeah. going to say late September, but yeah. it's like getting my months right. Late, <laughs> late October Yeah. into, into, into November. early November. Yeah. So yeah. Just, yeah. just after the winter's finished, everything yeah. will be warming up. Mm. But that's not a good thing, right? Because then we're going into Antarctica. So we need a bit of cold. I think we need a bit of cold to prepare us for, go for Antarctica, because that's... Probably minimum minus I'm, 45. I'm sure it'll be pretty cold in the Andes. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of have to go over them. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Which is, I think is going to be a challenge, but also an amazing experience, right? Driving through the Andes, I mean, you see the, again, watching documentaries um, and, and long way, long way up. Um, watching that and what they saw, I mean, that's just going to be spectacular. I can't I, wait for I that. I hope that you... Uh, that you have an amazing trip. It has been really good to both see you guys because I haven't seen you <laughs> yeah, for a long time. It's been amazing. Uh, but also to catch up on this amazing trip. Where can people find out about the trip and how can they support you? 
So a couple of ways. So to find out about the trip and see kind of daily updates, if they go to our social media channels, which is at pole to pole EV, that's across Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we also have a website, which is www.poletopoleev.com. And on there, we have a GoFundMe if people would like to kind of contribute, so. And you're going to be traveling south. Uh, do you want to let us know any potential cities you might be hitting on the way, or are you kind the of West flexible? Coast, isn't it, really? Yeah, heading we're down taking West the West Coast, Coast so right. we're going to be heading down. We're going to be hitting Sil Silicon Valley soon, um, and then into Los Angeles. And then from there, it's literally get ourselves back across the East Coast, where we've already come from, um, and go into Mexico. Great. And so if you're watching this, we're filming this on the last day of June. I think this, this video is going to drop in about a week and a half's time. So if you hear this, watch this around about that time, you'll probably already be in yeah. LA by yeah. that exactly, point. Yeah. But keep yeah. your eyes open yeah. as they go across, yeah. uh, obviously Arizona yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there are many people who would love to buy you a meal or offer you some hospitality. So yeah, give us a shout on reach social. Reach out. The yeah. kindness exactly. of We've the had so many awesome kind people. people so far reaching out and saying, look, swing by our place. We've got a charge. We've got somewhere to stay. and. That's been some of the most, the high, biggest highlights yeah. of our trip. Like you said, it's, we're being powered by the kindness of people. And um, even like yourself, Nikki. <laughs> and, and even um, if that, it's kind of like, even if you just see us on the road, like we get loads of people just seeing us, like, mobile phones come out of windows when we're on the highway. So yeah. if you see us on the road and you just want to like take a picture and share it to our social Give us a wave, tag us in. say hello, and um, cool. more than happy to, to see us all. It's been incredible, hasn't it? Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Enjoy the rest of the trip. Thanks Thank guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. And on that note, we are done with today's video. Make sure that you follow Chris and Julie on their epic adventure. I'm just a little bit jealous, but I'm glad I got to catch up with them before they headed south. If you have thoughts, make sure to drop them in the comments below. You can reach out to us on Mastodon. You can also pop into our Discord chat room and let us know what you think. And of course, if you are a Patreon supporter, you can reach out to us on the Patreon page is a great way to interact with other Patreon supporters. If you do want more from the channel, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Kofi Bitcoin and Swag Store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing charged up supporters and shout outs go out to our V to G Patreon supporters, Pedro Mora Pinheiro, Alan Topper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hey Esker, John Tremont, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Raging Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tesla in the Gong, Paul Brecknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Lasanta, Danny Hyde, Lance Schlaal, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big, big thanks to our off-grid supporters. They are Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnek, Nigel S, The Reggie Watts, uh, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make content every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on this channel, a day earlier if you are a Patreon supporter or YouTube channel member. And then on the Sunday, if you like to know what's going on in my garden and what my chickens and my dogs are doing, head on over to Transport Evolved Take Two where you'll find the chicken and garden update. And if you want to ponder something over your Saturday or Sunday afternoon, rather, just head over there on the Sunday for our Sunday using. Thanks for joining me and as always, keep evolving.